The Hells Angels, a well-known motorcycle club, has cultivated a rebellious and freedom-centric image, representing a distinctive biker culture. However, beneath their tough exterior lies a disconcerting reality of widespread mistreatment of women within the organization. While acknowledging that not all members partake in such behavior, numerous allegations have surfaced, exposing a troubling pattern of abuse. One woman at the center of attention is Chrissy Hind, an American singer renowned for her role in the rock band The Pretenders. In her new autobiography, 80s Rock Chick, Hind shockingly reveals a traumatic incident from her past. At the age of 21, she was raped by a group of Hell's Angels bikers. What adds to the astonishment is Hind's inclination to shoulder the blame, attributing the attack to her drug-induced state, flirtatious behavior, and youthful naivety. Hind's self-accountability took a controversial turn as she openly stated that the entire ordeal was her own doing. In her criticism, she targeted women who go out while intoxicated and dressed provocatively, suggesting that they shouldn't express complaints if they find themselves in trouble. These statements stirred up a storm of controversy, drawing both fury and disappointment, especially from her feminist admirers, who had not anticipated such seemingly anti-women perspectives from someone who identifies as a feminist icon. The events leading to Chrissy Hines' encounter with the Hells Angels and the aftermath raise intriguing questions about the impact on her life. Before becoming the lead singer of The Pretenders, Hind embraced the rock and roll lifestyle of drugs, alcohol, and rebellion. Her attraction to the bad boy image is well known, and in her book, she details the fateful night in 1972 when she was raped by a gang of Hell's Angels. The bikers, known for providing security at rock concerts, had met Hind a few years prior at a concert in Cleveland. Invited to their clubhouse, she recalls the disturbing ambience with swords, crossbows, whips and Nazi regalia adorning the walls. However, on that occasion, the girls were spared any advances as the bikers believed them to be underage. A few years later, at the Cleveland Municipal Jail, Hind, then 21 and high on drugs, met the bikers again. This time, the bikers seized the opportunity, inviting her to a party, and she agreed. The party took place at a different, more sinister clubhouse, leaving Hind with a chilling feeling reminiscent of Jeffrey Dahmer's hideout. The macabre atmosphere set the stage for a traumatic event that would later prompt Hind to blame herself, sparking a complex dialogue about consent, responsibility, and the consequences of one's choices. In her account, Hind describes the chilling events that unfolded when she found herself in the Hell's Angels' clutches. Unchaining a series of padlocks, they revealed a dark and noticeably empty house. The realization of what might transpire dawned on her, and she referred to the impending party as one hosted exclusively by yours truly. Led upstairs to a poorly lit room, Hines' protests were met with threats of violence. The bikers ordered her to perform sexual acts, using intimidation to coerce compliance. Matches were lit and thrown at her naked body when she hesitated, pushing her to eventually give in to their demands. The following day, one of the bikers drove her home, patting her on the thigh and commenting, you ain't a half bad chick. Despite the traumatic experience, Hind chose not to go to the police. Instead, she suggests in her book that she viewed the incident as part of the experiences she craved after a stable yet dull upbringing. Rather than seeking justice, Hind shockingly started a brief relationship with the blonde biker, even being involved in situations where she was subjected to physical abuse. She recounts an instance where the biker's friend, presumably another gang member, engaged in what she describes as a form of sexual foreplay involving violence. As the abuse escalated, with a particularly brutal incident leaving her seeing white stars exploding around the room, Hind realized the danger she was in. However, escaping the bikers was a perilous process as she had heard of the retribution faced by women who left the gang. Hind's revelation of this dark episode from her past at the age of 63 offers a sobering glimpse into the harrowing experiences she endured, challenging traditional perceptions of rock and roll excess. Even at the tender age of 16, she was already charming her way into the hotel suites of rock stars, setting the stage for a life marked by resilience and defiance. The narrative continues with Rod Stewart and Ronnie Wood being among the first to catch Hines' attention during their tour with the Jeff Beck Group. 
Hind recounts Stuart suggestively prodding the neck of his guitar into her rear, although she claims that the sexual innuendo was lost on her, as she was still playing with dolls at that time. Instead of pursuing further advances, they ended up getting stoned and playing silly word games. In 1973, after moving from Ohio to swinging London, Hind briefly worked as a journalist for the New Musical Express. She asserts that she was primarily hired for her sex appeal. One of her first pieces, a caustic review of a Neil Diamond record, resulted in death threats. Subsequently, she worked as an assistant at Sex, the Chelsea clothing store run by Malcolm McLaren and Vivian Westwood, where she took industrial quantities of drugs. Immersed in the London scene, Hind lived in a Chelsea squat associating with aspiring rock stars who would later form bands like The Clash and The Sex Pistols. John Lydon, also known as Johnny Rotten, was an early ally, and they even earned money together as domestic cleaners. Despite her friend's rising fame, musical success eluded Hind, leading her to menial jobs while her life continued to revolve around drugs, including heroin. Lemmy, the frontman of Motorhead, was a drug-taking comrade, and Hind recalls a memorable encounter where he introduced her to a white powder. Despite her harrowing experience with the Hell's Angels in Cleveland, Hines' attraction to bikers persisted, as her boyfriend during that time was the sergeant-at-arms of the London chapter. Her penchant for taking risks with her personal safety also persisted, highlighting a period marked by rock and roll excess, rebelliousness, and a seemingly carefree attitude. During a brief period back in Ohio, Hind hitched a ride from a motorist in a dodgy part of town. The driver gave her mescaline, a powerful psychedelic drug, and she found herself waking up naked in a grotty hotel room. The man had blocked the door with a wardrobe, threatening to strangle her with a lamp cord if she tried to escape. Despite the harrowing situation, they ended up taking a shower and going to bed together, with Hind tripping on mescaline throughout. The man eventually stole all her money and took her home. Reflecting on this reckless experience, Hind acknowledges the grimness of the situation but takes responsibility, admitting, It was grim, but it was my own damn fault. What kind of idiot jumps in a car with a stranger? This incident serves as a stark reminder of the risks she was willing to take during that tumultuous period of her life. Hind finally found the success she craved in 1978 when she joined three Englishmen to form The Pretenders. However, the band faced challenges due to drug-related issues. Pete Farndon, the bass player and Hines' lover, was sacked in 1982 over his drug-taking. Two days after his departure, the band's guitarist, James Honeyman Scott, died of heart failure following a cocaine overdose. Farndon himself died the following year, drowning in his bath after overdosing on heroin. Hind admits she has never fully gotten over losing Farndon, expressing remorse for taking him into her reckless world. Despite celebrating the high points of her life, such as a brief dalliance with her idol Iggy Pop, she doesn't shy away from the low points. These include her ill-fated two-year relationship with Ray Davies, lead singer of The Kinks and father of her daughter Natalie. The tempestuous relationship involved dramatic incidents, such as Hind throwing Davies' clothes out of a hotel window, only for them to be picked up by a passing truck before they could be retrieved. In the early 80s, Chrissy Hind and Ray Davies arranged to get married at Guildford Register Office. For the big day, Hind wore a white silk suit with matching white button-up ankle boots. However, the ceremony didn't go as planned. When they arrived, the guy at the register office took one look at them and suggested they come back another time. Hind humorously attributes this to her mascara being smeared all over her face, giving away the emotional turmoil of the situation. Reflecting on the incident, Hind admits that even a stranger could tell they were making a mistake. They ended up taking separate trains back to London. While the later years are not covered in her memoir, it's mentioned that Hind married Simple Minds lead singer Jim Kerr in New York in 1984 after meeting while touring in Australia. The marriage lasted five years and produced her second daughter, Yasmin. During this period, Hind was a self-styled militant vegetarian, advocating for outlawing killing animals and eating meat. She emphasizes her commitment to vegetarianism, stating that she could never kiss a man if she knew he had been eating meat. 
Additionally, she was a supporter of the Hare Krishna movement, regularly visiting their temples and inviting devotees to her home. Hines' decision to put her life down on paper was influenced by her old friend John McEnroe. Whenever he played at Wimbledon, he would contact her for a hangout knowing she had pot. While she acknowledges her past involvement with drugs, she makes it clear in her book that she is not celebrating drug use. Many of her hard-living friends are prematurely dead, leading her to distance herself from the glamorization of rock and roll excess. In the concluding remarks of her memoir, Hind asserts a blunt and battle-hardened view that drugs only cause suffering, emphasizing a cautionary stance against their use. She also touches on her uncompromising views on rape, which may challenge the perspectives of her liberal admirers. The video concludes by inviting comments and opinions on Chrissy Hines' story and whether she is to blame for the events described.